Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the next speaker on stage from our gold sponsor, Charit the Silver, Chief Architect at Fortune. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. That's been the catchphrase of last year with all the calls. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Um, so I'm continuing that tradition. Uh, it's been serious nostalgia following a, or sharing a stage with Pasanur De Silva after like eight years. Um, yeah, Charit De Silva, Chief Architect at Fortitude. So I'm trying to answer a question that we've been having for some time. Um, right. Uh, so this is a guy called Socrates, long time ago, quite big on beards, uh, also big on togas. Um, also quite popular for philosophical debate. Um, so he argued the question or debated the question, uh, who guards these guardians who guard us? Fast forward to the 1980s, a comic book artist named Alan Moore asked the same question, who Watches the Watchmen. Now at this point, if you're worried whether I've completely lost the plot, I've got the conference messed up. I haven't. Just bear with me, I'll get to the point of it, right? Let me ask you a question before I answer this question. What is the single most important thing that drives this business that we call the software industry? Why does Google or GDG Oh, this is not working, is it? Okay. Uh, I don't like these things. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, why do we, why does Google have this conference every year? Why would a business spend millions of dollars and hire an organization like the one that I represent to build software? The simple answer, the simple denominator, why that all happens is user experience. Think about it, right? The reason Google has this conference every year is to focus on a fraction of its user base developers so that it can elevate the user experience of developers. When an organization or a business hires a software firm to build a piece of software, it's trying to elevate the user experience of its end users by being more productive and efficient. It all boils down to user experience. And now at this point, I need to ask you another question. Right? So these are the two suspects, main suspects. Right? There are more, there are more abusers, but these are the murderers. So if you go to these, some websites, government websites, I hope there's no one from the government, <laughs> annually to get certain, certain services done, you would see buttons here and there that you would have to look through a looking glass to find where the button is. Those are abusers, but not murderers. When a system is down and you can't submit the button, that's a murder. And that's usually caused by software that's down. Now, that's caused by poorly maintained software and software is not properly maintained. There's another limiting factor. And ironically, that limiting factor for your efficiency and user experience are humans, because humans are creative beings. We are not very good at repetitive tasks or mundane tasks. You get a human to go through 10,000 Excel sheets, summarize it and put it onto a different form. By the 10th form, either the human will get up and leave, or there will be so many errors that it won't be worth doing it. So that's another limiting factor when you get humans to do those sort of tasks. Therefore. We automate. We create bots so they can do these tasks that humans don't want to do. Because more than all, quality is not an afterthought. Quality is something that we live, right? And hu bots are quite robust. They scale rather well. They are productive and they are efficient. So once they start going, they'll do an amazing job. They do it so fast, they can go through thousands of documents, summarize them, 
and fill them into other forms. They'll go through Excel sheets, through all of those things amazingly fast. They'll do it faster than the rupee depreciates. Amazing, right? Not like humans. <laughs> However, now there's another problem with this whole thing. So bots are easy to build. You can do that, all of that. Like everything in life, even that has a problem. We need to vaccinate them. Now, with this point, we went back and we thought about something that was theorized, if, I memory, if my memory serves me right, back in the 1980s, I believe, called artificial immune systems. Artificial immune systems are computational systems that are modeled after the vertebrate immune system. Vertebrates are things like us. Most of us have a backbone, so things like us, right? Things with a backbone. Um, so there are two parts to the vertebrate immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. Innate immune system we are born with, so it knows, needs, knows to do certain things. The adaptive immune system, it learns as it goes, right? So whenever there's a, whenever there's a certain situation that it doesn't know how to react, it'll learn and then it'll adapt according to that. So we try to fuse these things and create bots that will be able to react to these situations so they'll be better, robust, and suited. Now, like everything else, most of the things that cause issues for these bots also are external. Either a browser not responding or a third-party system goes down, something like that. Because um, you can have all the technology you want, Look what happened to us, right? Millennia of evolution, all the technological marvel we had, tiny speck of a virus called coronavirus, kaput. Everything done, right? Multiple years of recession, everything all gone. So they needed vaccination. Let's take a simple, let me get to the whole picture in one go. Right. Um, let's take the simpler scenario, the first stage, which is a fault tolerance. You can call it fail safe or fail soft or whatever the name you want. These are bots that have an innate immune system or the predefined immune system, which is rule based. Um, so they are pre programmed with certain set of knowledge they can respond to. They can't learn, but they know what to do in a particular scenario. So if you take the very simple example put here, a bot that goes through a set of documents, extract some data, put it in a browser-based form. Now at some point, the browser stops responding. And there's predefined knowledge within the bot to know if the browser goes down, what am I supposed to do? It goes through its records and see the browser is not responding. At this point, I'm supposed to restart the browser. It tries to restart the browser. Okay, browser is restarted. Can I perform my duties now? Yes, I can perform. The show goes on. Done. That is stage one of it. This is very simple to do. This is a fail safe. It's not at all that advanced. That's something that happens at stage one. Now if we go to stage two, these are bots who can communicate with an SRE. Um, I'll get to SREs because SREs are quite important, this whole picture. Bots who can monitor their own SLIs, um, these are service level indicators. Bots who can highlight cascading effects and call for help when they need. This is something humans are remarkably bad at. Humans don't call for help until everything catches on fire. And even then, they ah, it's okay, we can fix it. And until everything goes down, they'll be like that. So this is something we, we learn at stage two. Um, now let me ask you another question. How do we recruit and train an SRE engineer? Oh, SRE, basically. Do we like gather a bunch of people or at this audience, do I go like point at one person and come forward thy human from this moment forward, thou shall be an SRE? and that person just lift up and come to me like that. Uh, doesn't happen, right? No. 
you, you interview a person, you recruit a person, and that person goes through weeks and months of training, and there are playbooks, knowledge transfers, particular scenarios that you go through. So much of knowledge is given to an SRE, right? And so much documented knowledge. So why not just give that to a bot? Because these are documented scenarios, right? If you take a particular, exam, particular application or even a bot itself, you have documented knowledge saying that if that, this bot is performing in this way, if the memory matrix or if the performance matrices are here, and if the SLIs are here, and if these error conditions are printed in these logs in this way, this is the remediation access. So why not just automate it? So these are stage two bots. So they can actually look at their own logs, look at their own performance matrices, and correct themselves. So they have taken it one step forward and they function on their own. The other thing is there are scenarios where sometimes when the business process is quite complex, bots work in swarms. Four or five bots work together. And then bot three or four or some, some bot in the middle failing would cause a cascading effect of the other business processes to fail. At that point, they can say, look, guys, sorry, I'm failing. I can't function. Everyone else is also going to fail. So please come and help. And that will be a call for help. So this would happen with the synchronization of an SRA engineer. So these bots can communicate. They can ask for help. And they can heal themselves. These are stage two bots. Now, since we talked about the SRA, let's go to the augmented SRA. When you say augmented, it's not like I'm not going to do an accent. These are not like terminators, OK? It's not different. Um, right. So for the innate immunity part, <coughs> the SRE is quite important because the SRE isolates problematic data. So there are good problematic data, there are bad problematic data. Um, the good problematic data is what you use for training, um, the innate immune system, what goes back into bots, and the bad just leave it off. And you identified common error formats, which can be grouped together, saying these are the ones that you use. And in certain scenarios, what, you all, what, what all you need is a simple retry. And sometimes you just need to fail gracefully and let a human, human engineer come and handle it. And for adaptive immunity, you need to look for similarities. Now, there are certain error conditions. You can, it's like fuzzy you can look for scenarios which are similar and apply same solutions as well. So that knowledge has to be given to the bots when they are being trained. So that, that input comes from an SRE. So those are, they are augmented in that sense. Then the other most important part is monitoring. So rather than a human staring at a computer monitor, trying to figure out what's going on, the bots monitor themselves. So there are three levels, right? There are SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. The SLA is what I make with a customer, saying I'll maintain 99.95 for you. But then you have service level objectives and service level indicators internally. So the bots maintain service level indicators themselves. And if something goes wrong, they'll escalate. And if everything is going fine, they'll say, look, guys, everything is fine. I'm perfectly fine. I'm healthy. Something doesn't go wrong, something goes wrong, they'll say, look, I'm not hitting my SLI numbers, I need help, come and look at this. So they are fused with the SRE, and they will ask for help when the numbers aren't looking great. So that's where the augmentation comes in. The SRE no longer has to do an active role. They are working in conjunction with the bots. And the other part is transparency. Everything that the bot does, is sent back to the SRE for auditing. So even if the bot restarts itself, that is shared. Or even if the bot can't do it, that's also shared. So even if the bot restarts itself, if it's a false positive, the SRE gets to see it and get involved and say, oh, look, this has been a false positive. I need to get involved and correct it. So the two systems go hand in hand um, because I'll leave it to you to answer who really watches the watchmen, but somebody needs to. So whether it's the SRE or the bots themselves, that's something for you to answer, but somebody needs to watch them. 
Um, so in summary, if somebody wants to build a system like this, the most important thing, like in any, any system or anything at all, is auditability. You need to be able to trace what's going on with these bots, or this is going to be a complete and utter nightmare, because everything will be restarting and doing whatever they want, and nobody will know what's going on. So traceability is at utmost importance. And you need to rely on principles of chaos engineering. You need to be able to predict the unpredictable. So you need to run chaos engineering exercises very frequently to be able to respond to critical scenarios. The third point is, of course, a no-brainer. Unless you have automated testing, you won't be able to build something like this. The last two points, because this whole exercise is about continuous monitoring, because everything that happens is being shared live. Everything needs to be monitored, and that information needs to be filtered and put back into the system one way or the other. Right? So continuous monitoring and continuous improvement needs to happen. So those are the five things or the summary of this entire system if, if one's trying to build something like that. This is what we found out. Right. So this is something I would like to have done in a longer time, but I've, I've been only given 15 minutes, so I try to cram everything in. I hope you learned something out of that. Um, so the watchman thanks you. Uh, figure it out who are they. So it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today and being on a physical stage. Uh, once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Charity Silva. And I would like to uh, request you to stay on stage. And I would like to call Nuvini Chamindi, um, GDG Sri Lanka lead, to come up on stage to give the token of appreciation. <laughs> 